Well, one of the first things that people have asked me is to why the name, Restoration Adventure 3.0. Well, the session name comes from our, uh, from our scriptures, where the Doctrine and Covenants tells us to be faithful to the spirit of the restoration and reminds us that this is an adventure that we're on with God. And that's going to be our prayer for tonight, is that we, in fact, will join in that spirit of adventure and openness and seeking and uh, uh, as we go and explore this. This class is also going to be an adventure because uh, as we set out on this journey, I have no idea yet what the last session might in fact look like. Uh, and that's something that we're going to discover and, uh, and learn together as we, uh, uh, as we explore. The idea for this uh, discussion was uh, conceived and nurtured by Kerry Richards. And I put his email and his phone number up there. So if you have any problems with it, you can call him directly. Um, Carrie was in Florida and Fort Myers uh, during the winter. And uh, as he joined that congregation, they were studying uh, some of this material in a particular book. And he thought that it would be very valuable for us in CEM to also uh, take the time to explore some of these topics. And so he spoke with the people who were facilitating and obtained some of the materials uh, from them. And so we want to also thank Gary Villeneuve and the Fort Myers, Florida congregation for the use of their materials particularly on the uh, John Dorhauer book. But in addition to Dorhauer, we also want to start by stepping back and saying, what are some other people already saying about where the church is going? And when I say the church, I mean uh, the Christian church as a whole. One of those people is Barbara Brown Taylor. And many of you have probably read some of her books or have heard about her. You'll see here on her webpage that she describes herself as a spiritual contrarian. And that she says that I say things you're not supposed to say. And I think in particular, one of the things that she uh, wants to say uh, is this is not working. And there are times when uh, uh, she raises her voice to say, this is not working for us and we need to work on uh, ways that we can find new expressions that will work for us. So we're gonna listen to something that, uh, that Barbara Brown Taylor has to say. We're also going to uh, uh, listen in and talk to Douglas John Hall. This is someone who is described by some as being Canada's greatest living theologian. He is an emeritus professor of theology from McGill University. He's now about 91 years old and was a minister and a theologian in the United Church of Canada for many, many years. And so we're gonna hear uh, from him. Part of our conversation is also about our own tradition. Our church has for some 20 years now, more than 20 years, been exploring what it means to be a prophetic people. And it started in 1996 as Grant McMurray uh, challenged us right from the beginning to, that we needed to talk about moving from an identity as a people with a prophet to our calling as a prophetic people. And surely that has to be part of our discussion as we think about moving the church forward, as we continue on this adventure with God uh, and, and exploring that. And so our prophets through the counsel that they have given have called us to think deeply about who we are and where we're called to be, both uh, Grant McMurray and Steve Vesey as well have uh, continued uh, challenging us with that theme of how do we respond as a prophetic people. So let's take a look at what some of these uh, thinkers and writers are saying. I found when I began to do some reading that I was surprised at how early many uh, thinkers had started to recognize that change was very much on the horizon. And certainly Barbara Brown Taylor was one of those. 
Now she's primarily writing in many of her books uh, for people who, for individuals, for people who are on uh, their own spiritual journey, who are looking for a spiritual path. And she noted that we always seem to think that we're missing something. This idea that if I just had X, whatever that is. And so here she says in one of her books, she says, we never long for what we already have. But often the reason we can't see the X that marks the spot that we think that we want to be is in fact because we are already standing on it. And so she's challenging us as individuals to say, what is it that we think we need? And she goes on to say, all that we lack is the willingness to imagine that we already have everything we need. I wonder if that also applies to churches and to us. She points out that the treasure that we're looking for doesn't require a lengthy expedition or special equipment or attitude or special company, but rather we already have everything that we need. Is God calling us as a church in the same way? Well, if we look at some of our uh, prophetic counsel, it says that God is in fact calling for a prophetic community of a particular kind. But then it goes on to say that this faith community has been given abundant gifts and resources and opportunities to equip it to become precisely such a people. And so the question that we need to be asking is, do we already have everything that we need? We as a church, as we stand here and we look at what's to come and we think about the uncertainty that is before us, we need to ask this question, do we simply lack the willingness to acknowledge that we may already have everything that we need for the journey? Barbara Brown Taylor goes on to say that often the only thing missing is our consent to be where we already are. And where are we as a church? Again, a prophetic council tells us that this adventure that we're on with God has been divinely led, has certainly been eventful and challenging and sometimes surprising. And perhaps one of the surprises to us is being told that we're poised to fulfill God's ultimate vision for the church. And again, the question that I wonder if we need to be asking ourselves is the only thing missing is our content, our, sorry, our consent to be poised to fulfill God's vision. Is that the part that is missing? If we then go on and we listen to, to uh, uh, Douglas John Hall, he wrote a book called Waiting for Gospel, and I don't know if you can see the fine print on the screen there, but the subtitle for his book is An Appeal to the, the Dispirited Remnants of Protestant Establishment. And so he's calling to the church. This is a book that's been written in the last decade, two decades. And he's calling to the church. And notice the title. It's not waiting for the gospel, as we would often say. And in fact, I've seen some of the reviews of his book that misspelled the title and automatically assumed that it meant waiting for the gospel. As if the gospel was some official set of doctrines or dogmas or something that we need in order to go forward. But in fact, he makes it clear that it's waiting for gospel waiting for good news and that the good news will change. Paul goes on to say 
the gospel is not a once for all belief system. It's not some intellectual property that simply belongs to the church and it looks exactly like this. He says, to the contrary, the church is the product of the gospel. What he's really saying here is that it's not the church dog that wags the gospel tail, but the gospel is the dog and the church is the tail. And so we need to be paying attention to what that gospel is calling us and, and, and us to do right now. Now, have we heard that idea before? Certainly, I think we have. We've heard this message that the spirit of the restoration, the adventure that we're on with God, is not locked in one moment of time, but instead is that call to every generation to witness in its own language and form. We've heard that message before. And Hall goes on to say that the church only becomes the church when it discovers the gospel for itself again and again and again. And in fact, that's a necessary process because it's through that rediscovery of the gospel that the church is actually capable then of proclaiming the gospel or good news in, it, in its context that it finds itself in the world. The church has heard this message before many times. Many times we have been told that we need to rediscover the restoration anew and discern for our own time and in the places where we serve. And that that world will require us to change, will require new forms and new ways of doing things. So what should we do with these scriptures? What should we do with this counsel that we've been given? Well, if you've been part of a scripture course, you know that one of the things that's really important to us is that we responsibly interpret scripture. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, if nothing else, you might learn a new word tonight, which is hermeneutics. Not a word that I use in everyday conversation, but theologians or scholars use hermeneutics as a way to describe the rules that we use for interpreting whatever, in this case, interpreting scripture. Well, what are the rules that we use for interpreting scripture? For Community of Christ, we have our statement on scripture that calls for us to responsibly interpret the scripture. And often what that means is we go through a process that we call exegesis. Exegesis comes from a Greek word that means to lead out. And so we're trying to look at something that has been written and to lead out what it means for us as we read it. Again, if you've been part of the uh, scripture courses, you know that the objective of exegesis is that we want to find out what the writer was trying to convey to their original audience. Now, we usually apply that to ancient scripture. So if we're looking at the New Testament, we're trying to understand what it meant to be someone in the first century. How did they understand something so that when we read a parable or we read something uh, that's, that's recorded in the New Testament, we understand how they would have heard it. And therefore, hopefully we get more meaning out of it. But if we can apply that to ancient scripture, why can't we also apply it to our modern scripture? Can we not go through the same process as we try to understand what that uh, scripture and what that counsel is trying to share with us? So anyone who's been in any of my, uh, my scripture classes knows that the top three rules of exegesis are very straightforward. Rule number one is context. Rule number two is context. And rule number three 
is context. Context, context, context is absolutely crucial for us to understand what someone was trying to convey to their original audience. Now, it just doesn't sound good to say context, 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 but it turns out that actually there are three different kinds of context if you look at that statement above. We could look at the context of what the writer, what context were they in, what was the context of the hearer of their original audience, and what was the context of the message? Why was that message necessary? What were they trying to get across? And so uh, that's something that we want to bring to this process as we start this journey together. So we ask ourselves, what is the context of the community of Christ audience that the council in these recent sections of Doctrine and Covenants has been given for? What is our context as the people who are hearing that as the original audience. We probably don't want to just assume that we know that, but we actually want to take a look at it. Then we might also ask, what is the context of community of Christ as an organization, as an institution, as a movement? What is our context in the 20 years that this council spans? And then there's the context of the world in which we live. What is the context around us that we need to be paying attention to as we look at moving forward? The numbers tell the story. When I first took over the church website in 2008, we had the numbers of congregations that you see in the blue bars. Today, we have the ones that are in the orangey colored bars. It tells the story that about 25% of the congregations that were there in 2008 have been closed. They are no longer there. Now that's not to say that the members are not involved, that the members aren't participating in other places, but it does tell us something about our context as an organization here in Canada. But that's not the only number that tells the story. There are other numbers that also have their own story. Membership has declined over that same period. Undoubtedly, contributions have declined over that same period. And you begin to ask yourself, haven't any of these numbers gone up? Well, sadly, yes, there is a number that has gone up. And that's very much the average age of our congregations has gone up dramatically in the last 20 and 30 years. This shouldn't be news to any of you. The very fact that you're here means that you, you understand what these issues are and care about them. And so the question that uh, immediately comes to mind, and we probably have heard, maybe you've even said yourself many times, where did we go wrong? What did we do? wrong that we don't have churches that are as full and as active and as plentiful as when we were growing up and for some of us that might mean 30 years ago for some of us 50 years ago and for some of us maybe 70 or more years ago how do we compare to some other churches in canada well, what do their numbers tell us? Pretty much their numbers are gonna tell us that congregations are closing, their members are declining, their financial contributions are declining, 
And yes, their average age is going up significantly. The numbers make it pretty clear that in fact, we're no different than any other Christian denomination that we find in Canada. And in fact, on some measures, you could argue that we're doing much better given that we have uh, a long tradition of using volunteer ministry. We have a long tradition of uh, 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 using resources and volunteer resources to do what other churches have to pay for. We have the advantage of a tradition of being small. We don't have buildings that would seat a thousand people that now are much smaller. And that's some of the challenges that many of the other Christian churches are facing. The numbers are dramatic. 9,000 churches, and I'm not even sure that they're talking about all of them, simply the ones from a heritage point of view that somebody cares about. It hurts when you see scenes like this, which I think is actually from downtown Waterloo, um, uh, when significant churches are being destroyed. And congregations all across the country look very much like ours do. Lots of gray hairs, lots of empty seats. So what if we expand the scope beyond Canada? Well, we kind of have the very same pictures. It's the same story. It's the same phenomenon. In Western Europe, they're probably 20 years ahead of us in that they've already gone through uh, much of this decline. In the US, we get slightly different numbers because of the, the uh, impact of the, uh, the evangelical uh, and the Bible Belt in the South. But the trends are all the same. So we might ask ourselves, well, is this just a challenge of churches? Is this just a church problem? Is this just a Christianity kind of problem? Well, any of you who are part of a service club or any kind of club, my wife and I sang in choruses that have the very same challenges. Their members are getting older. They have very few new ones coming in. Whether you're a part of a chorus, a historical society, a collector's club, any organization that has members and membership is experiencing the same kinds of challenges. A 2014 study not only found, also found out that even country clubs, that their membership is down significantly. So this is a phenomenon that obviously goes beyond just church. And so we ask ourselves, what's going on here? Meanwhile, back at church, we've all said this, but we have to do something. And the question is, what should that something be? Well, <clears throat> many of us really, really, really want to believe, like our, our uh, far side cavemen here, that this is possible, if we could just find that one magic spot, that one silver bullet, that one special thing, if we only did X like we did back in the old days, or if we only did Y like they do here, then everything could be different. And we really, really want to believe that. But all of the evidence suggests that isn't going to happen. That in fact, what we're going to, what we're seeing and what we're going to continue seeing is wave after wave after wave of change. And so that brings us back 
to our friend John Dor Dorhauer in his book, Beyond Resistance. The institutional church meets the postmodern world. And the first line of his book says, let's be honest. Dorhauer is a minister in the US and the United uh, Church of Christ, um, which has gone through trajectory that is absolutely similar to what every other denomination, including Community of Christ, has gone through in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And it's out of his experience that he wrote this book. And so he starts out by simply saying, let's be honest. What do we already know? Well, we know that the world is not the same as it was before. And each of us has an image in our mind when we apply that to, the, to our church experience of what before is. It may be where we're currently going to church. It may be at another place. But we all have some image in our mind. And he's simply saying, it's not going to be like that again. Because changes in the church meaning the large church, are happening and we can't stop them. And it's from that that he gets the title of his book, of saying that these changes are beyond our resistance. These waves of change that are coming at us are not just something that we can shrug off and continue doing what we're doing. Because we're already on a path where that's not going to continue to work. And in fact, the reality is very simple. Some churches, some congregations are going to die. And what do we do with that? His first advice is good advice, I think, where he simply says, allow them to die with dignity to celebrate their achievements, the difference that was made in lives, try to understand what it was about their experience that we might be able to learn from and grieve their loss. But then we need to move forward, not to forget about what we've learned, not to forget about the sacrifices that were there, but rather to simply say, we must go on and continue. But what else do we know? Well, Dorauer looks at a whole bunch of, of indicators that tell us a story. And one of the first ones, special numbers, is 1961. Perhaps some of you were born that year or had other important things happen in your life. It turns out that 1961 was a particularly important year in the life of the church. And of course, these are U.S.-based numbers, but I believe that the Canadian numbers would be very, very similar. Every year, I don't know how far back the statistics went, but every year before 1961, the church grew by a minimum of 1% per year. And every year after 1961, membership declined by a minimum of at least 1% a year. And these statistics are very common across all denominations. All denominations have seen membership losses, congregations closing, because of the financial cost of clergy and dealing with aging property and the decline and the change in the economy and so on and so on. You can find a gazillion uh, different factors that all have contributed to this same phenomenon. Some churches of particular type have, have particularly what we call the high demand churches and include our uh, LDS friends, uh, evangelicals, um, 
they have had the same experience, although they have been able to push it out by another decade or two than many of the other denominations. But they too are seeing the same trends affecting their uh, membership and their costs and their trajectory going forward. If we look at census data and other kinds of surveys, we also see some remarkable different numbers. This is one from the 2017 American Family Survey. And you can see that for the first time, the largest segment that is shown is the nuns, the group in the kind of funky yellow color down in the corner. Not only are they the largest group, bigger than Protestant, bigger than Roman Catholic, and certainly much bigger than many of the other uh, traditions, but it's also the fastest growing category. Now this is an American survey, and in fact, this is one place where, mostly because of the influence of evangelicals in the, in the Bible Belt in the southern US, where Canada sees an even bigger disparity. In Canada, the nuns are a larger percentage than in the US, and in fact, are faster growing. Well, what other numbers make sense? We've seen here that religious pluralism, or the, the, the uh, mix of religious cultures that we have in our society, is changing. Where are these changes coming from? Dorhauer points out that one of the most significant ones for us to understand is birth rate. Birth rate has changed dramatically in our lifetime. You can see from 1909 to 1960, it only decreased by about nine births per thousand women. But the next 50 some years almost cut it in half. Dramatic change in the birth rate in North America. The numbers in Canada are very similar. And this shouldn't surprise anyone. Right now, as we uh, we'll hear lots of rhetoric as we head into our election about immigration and about the need for immigration, as you can see that here in the 2000s, our fertility rate is below what's needed to simply keep our, our, our uh, uh, population constant. That in order to grow at all, then we definitely need to have other people coming in. But what it really shows is that the declining birth rate coincides with the decline in church membership. And essentially, if we were to run the numbers, we would have to have every single child of every single family and their children and their children would have had to become engaged members of, of whatever church they were born into just to keep the membership at a constant level. And of course, we know that that didn't happen and that that wasn't going to happen. So the birth rate peaked the final year of the boomer generation, and then it started to drop. And so did the automatic internal growth rate that the church had, had enjoyed for many decades begin to drop as well. So just the sheer numbers of the changing uh, uh, size and style of families that we begin to have in our, in our culture had its impact on membership. We simply didn't need to keep building more churches 
because we had more and more people because we had more and more children and more and more young adults and more and more families. But not only was that changing, but over that same time period since the early 60s, we've seen a dramatic increase in the mobility of families. As the birth rates dropped, families also became more and more mobile, which impacts two different things. One is obviously the internal growth rate because if somebody leaves your area, then they're not going to be part of your congregation anymore. But it also meant for a church like Community of Christ, keeping track of and keeping active members engaged when they're moving all over made them a moving target. And both of those had their impact. So I think I'm gonna pause there for just a moment and ask before we go on to the next section, if there's any questions somebody wants to raise. And again, you can unmute by uh, holding down your space bar or you can type questions in the chat. Anything there? All right, well, I'll take that as a confirmation that I was either exceedingly clear or exactly the opposite and everyone's confused. But e either case, let's move forward. Dorhauer points out, as you can see in the title of his book, that the biggest change is who we have become as a culture. And that's this amorphous term called postmodernism. Now, if you're a left brain techie like me, if somebody's going to say that there's, there's a certain age or an era, I'd like to have a really definitive definition of when it started and when it ended. I want to know that this age started, you know, on Thursday, May the 3rd at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Unfortunately, when we talk about these terms like postmodernism, we don't get that kind of a definition. Here we get really vague and fuzzy definitions. So people will talk about postmodernism architecture and postmodernism art and postmodernism this and postmodernism that. And it's also now becoming simply this, this overall cultural term. And even the academics don't agree. It's very controversial as to whether it started over a span of 50, 60, 70 years. And some would even claim that postmodernism really isn't even a thing yet, that it hasn't started. So this is definitely a section that is not academically rigorous in any way, shape, or form. And even the academics that do look at it would probably be horrified by my chainsaw approximation of how I understand as we go through these transition uh, from one era to the other. So with that caveat, I just want to take a little step back. And in order for us to understand what postmodernism is, we probably want to understand what it is that we were leaving and talk about modernism or the modern era. So again, don't be quoting me on this too much um, because I'm sure that no matter how you look at it, uh, someone would find something to argue with. However, in my understanding, the modern era has been going on for several centuries. The modern era loosely covers the beginnings of the age of reason, covers the industrial revolution, covers the age of enlightenment or the enlightenment uh, era, the whole frame of scientific discovery. And you could find a whole bunch of other categories or, or sub eras that are in there. But all of these were about the massive 
progress that humankind was making during this time from uh, studies in, in mathematics and in science and in inventions and all kinds of things and discovery. It just seemed that everything was simply going up and up and up. And, excuse me, and so the sense that goes along with this part of the era is that the sky is the limit. Look at all the wonderful things that we discovered about the world around us, about, about science, about animals, about the earth, about this, about that. Humans are awesome. Look at all of the things that we're doing, the places that we're going. This could just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. And it sort of did until there was suddenly a big splat. And suddenly there was World War I. Well, that was supposed to be the war to end all wars. And then it kind of got followed by the Great Depression. Another huge expanse of human misery, much of which came out of greed and foolishness. And then we followed that up with World War II. And certainly as we look at the big scope of history, we went from going from this era of saying the sky's the limit, the humans are awesome, to saying, uh, maybe not, humans are evil. This really stinks. And so there was an enormous um, shift of attitudes that went on there. Now again, some people would claim that the postmodern era began in the 1930s. Others would say in the 1950s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s, somewhere in there in the last century, many begin to see that there was this fundamental shift a fundamental change that was going on in the Western world. And again, there's a certain arrogance and privilege as we look at all of this that comes because we're talking about all of this happening in the world, but from our perspective as the wealthy Western countries. For most of the 1950s and the 60s, and again, Many of, many of us lived through those times as adults. Some of us lived through them as children. After the wars, certainly we had a whole generation that were just happy to come home and happy to be alive, happy to work hard, kind of ignored what today we would understand was the PTSD that came from their experiences there. And in particular, this, this big idea of living the American dream, which was all uh, caught up in, uh, in that whole idea of what life was supposed to be like. But there was this kind of emptiness. And the question was, and so what now? What's going to fill it? Well, mass media appeared, particularly in the form of television, and said, me, me, I'll fill the gap in your life. You just need to buy the right car. You just need to buy these new things that we're inventing. You just need to buy these new appliances and your life will be good. Anyone who's written some of Bill Bryson's writings, particularly his book about growing up in Des Moines, Iowa in the 1950s, he recounts his parents spending three or four hours talking with the neighbors about the wonders of one refrigerator model versus another and whether this one could keep ice cream cold compared to that one. <laughs> 
And what was going on in the churches? Well, there were lots of things that were going on. But this was the era when this notion was revived that God is dead. Now, most of us don't understand the context of which that statement was being given, but it still was talking about this idea that, that the enlightenment and the age of reason and all of those things were eliminating the need to have God in our lives because we knew so much, so much more. And so in the 50s and 60s, you had theologians like Paul Tillich and others talking about that concept and saying, well, wait a minute, maybe we just weren't asking the right questions. We go another decade or two, and again, many of us lived through this time. This became a time of protests versus Protestantism. And of course, that's a very sweeping generalization. But this was a time of much protest and disillusionment as the children of all of those vets who came back from the war were now becoming of age. And they looked at the life that they inherited and said, I'm not sure about this. There was great disillusionment with consumerism, disillusionment with this whole idea that it was all about the American dream. There was great disillusion with what was going on in the world, particularly the Vietnam War. Greater disillusion with governments. Disillusion with capitalism and with patriarchy. As we saw the rise of feminism in its first rendition. And essentially there was a disillusion with pretty much everything that mom and dad did and what they liked and what they worked for and what they valued. And so it was a very, very different time. And again, we see elements of that in our popular culture today. I'm not a big fan, don't, don't, don't always watch Law and Order, but I happened to watch one episode and it was all about the youngsters today going to talk to all of these senior people who were involved in certain things that were just a little bit on the edge. And everyone they talked to just shrugged and said, well, it was the 60s. And everybody else just shrugged and said, yeah, that pretty much explained it. And the kids didn't understand it because they didn't understand the context in which these people had grown up. Now we jump forward another couple of decades and what's happening. One of the biggest phenomenons that we see is that the world is shrinking. Our awareness of what's going on in the world has gone up dramatically. Cable news has a 24 hour news cycle. The test pattern on television is now part of the past. It never shuts off. We have a 24 hour news cycle. They have to fill it with something. And so they fill it with every detail and every miserable bit of suffering that they can find anywhere in the world becomes fodder for that 24 hour news cycle. We begin to see in order to fill all these hours and all the hundreds of cable news uh, or cable channels that we have, the so-called reality TV, which many people say is simply a revival of the freak show of the Victorian era. And again, where people suffering and the things that are happening to people become entertainment. We see the rise of the internet. And amongst the hundreds and hundreds of impacts that it has is the fact that distance disappears. We can now talk to somebody on the other side of the world 
as easily as we can talk to someone in the next room. And not only talk to them, but we can play video games with them, we can share with them, and we can even do Zoom sessions like this. Hierarchies get flattened when suddenly on Twitter or Facebook or any other kind of social media or even email, you can begin to get conversations with people who you never used to be able to see before. The people that run this company or that company or this uh, organization. And so many places, the hierarchies and the, and the barriers that were between uh, people begin to disappear. We know anything that happens in the world, particularly if it's bad. If it's a natural, natural disaster of any kind, there's someone on the ground who is reporting that. The internet gives everyone and anyone can have a voice. Unfortunately, even those that we wish didn't have a voice, but nonetheless, they are there. What we don't have yet is some of the mechanisms for dealing and understanding which voices are still to be heard and which ones we need to ignore. All of this cultural change as we now get into the 90s and into the early 2000s, we think about what impact these changes are having on the kids that grew up in that time. We're now seeing people you know, who, who were born in the 2000s. If you're a tennis fan and you watch Bianca Andreescu, she's the first one who was born in the 2000s. For some of us, we find that hard to believe. We find it hard to believe that it's been decades since the Berlin Wall come down, that it's been even more decades uh, since other historical events happened. And yet all of this cultural change has been filtered into the experience of all of these people who grew up in that era. One of the big ones is there's nowhere to hide. All of the ugliness of humanity is absolutely on display. And this ugliness becomes essentially entertainment. Everywhere people have seen the church show up in, whether it's in the, the, uh, the, the preeminent, the Catholic uh, pre-sex abuse uh, scandals or the scandals that involved other ministerial abuse and misconduct. Every detail has been out there in the public. Every instance of government abuse and misconduct is on display. Every incidence of corporate abuse and misconduct is on display, as it is in education, in nonprofits, in every kind of human organization that you can imagine. If there have been problems, it shows up on the news. Now, I'm not arguing for an instant or suggesting that those things, that the light shouldn't be shone in those dark corners. But we also need to understand that living on a constant diet of this kind of information coming out of your television, coming out of your computer, coming out of your phone, your tablet, in a constant barrage, in a constant flow, has got to have some impact on how we, and especially the we that is the, the kids who are growing up in that era, who are now young adults, how they see and understand the world. And it's very different, certainly has the potential to be very different than how we did. Fear is now sold every moment of every day, whether it's on talk radio, on cable news, or programs like Nancy Grace that continually tell us that we need to fear because behind every telephone pole, behind every mailbox, around every corner, uh, 
are all of these things that could happen. That was true 50 and 70 years ago. The numbers typically haven't changed much, but our knowledge has changed dramatically. What this means for us then is that postmoderns have a very, very different view of the world. And Dorhauer spends a great deal of his book, and we're going to talk about this in the next session, of understanding what this postmodern mindset really means. The first statement that he makes is that that mindset says there are no universal truths. That what is true for you may or may not be true for me. And we'll explore what some of those truths used to be that we accepted as being true and are no longer necessarily accepted. That's got to have a big impact on our culture as we go forward. The second major mindset that Dorhauer highlights is that postmoderns would say, we learn differently. What does that mean as we begin to think about in the context of our church in terms of how the lessons that we learned in church need to be expressed and taught and presented and demonstrated and illustrated in different ways. And lastly, the third mindset is simply we don't trust institutional authority. Tons of research is available that shows decade after decade after decade that the amount that people trust institutions in our world has declined. It used to be that it was only used car salesmen and, and, and other uh, kinds of ventures like that that had to worry about the lack of trust that everyone had. And now we're seeing this gap, this chasm begin to develop between an entire population of people and the institutions that are allegedly there to serve them. We see this distrust of authority in a whole bunch of places. We see it in science, we see it in medicine, we see it in government, we see it in education, we see it in almost all realms of life. And yes, we see it very big in terms of trusting churches and the institutions that they represent. So as we come to the end of this session, we're left with this big question that says, given those mindsets, what does this context that we have for community of Christ? What does this context for our congregation? What is this context for Christianity? All of those contextual uh, challenges that we just looked at, when we take all of those together, what does a postmodern church in the future, what is it actually going to look like? Or what does it need to look like? Or what do we think it needs to look like in order to have meaning and appeal and relevance in the lives of people who have grown up in the last 20 years, the last 30 years, the last 40 years? For sure, we know that it's going to be different than the church that we grew up with.
And part of our adventure as a church is for us to understand that we're going through this transition. So my little advertisement for the next session is this is where we're going to get into uh, Dorhauer's, uh, 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 where, where the 3.0 in our title comes from, which says, he looks at it and says, we're now looking at a completely different kind of church because of the way that our culture has changed, because of these mindsets, because of this context, the things that have made sense for the last several hundred years no longer are going to apply. And so we need to turn a corner in a generational way, in a transitional way, so that we can begin to have some relevance if we want to remain relevant in that world. Community of Christ has also in our tradition, as from the beginnings in the mid-19th century, as we've gone through our own traditions, history, and culture, we've been through some transitions. And those of you who have been fortunate enough to be in Tony and Charmaine Shavala Smith's uh, course on the three eras of the church will remember that we too are now on the 3.0 version of what it means to be a church. And so those are the things that we're going to look at in our, in our session uh, coming up in, in three weeks, is to say, what does it mean in a church context when we talk about postmoderns? What does it mean as an organization as we look at becoming a 3.0 kind of church? And what are the things, what are the resources and the assets that Community of Christ brings? We hearken back to the council that we looked at at the very beginning and ask the question that says, do we already have everything that we need for this journey? And that's what we'll look at next time. So that's the, uh, the end of, of uh, uh, my official part of my presentation tonight. I want to again open up and we'll, we'll open up the lines and take calls from anybody who, uh, who wants to ask questions or, uh, or make any comments. Hello. Yes. Okay. Um, Dorhauser, uh, talking about, uh, you know, the, I guess was the third, um, I'm trying to think what they, what he called it, uh, did with modernism. Okay. The third right. or symptom or about trust or, about trusting authority. Yeah. Trusting authority. Um, that's probably, he's, I'm guessing, an American writer, and Americans have historically always mistrusted uh, government. Mm -hmm. And are you positing then that yeah. our experience in Canada is going to be significantly different? Uh, I probably... A little less so than the American culture. Um, I would say that probably we have had growing mistrust of government. You can certainly see it, especially during election time. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think uh, Americans have always had what they would consider a very healthy mistrust of government, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the whole idea of uh, their Second Amendment with having arms.
the idea of that was that so that the population could uprise and overthrow the government if necessary. Right. So one of the questions is that the the uh, government is only one kind of authority. And so while I uh, certainly don't disagree with your assessment that uh, different countries and different cultures might have uh, uh, different levels of, of trust or mistrust, um, you know, we see that in a whole bunch of different venues. Uh, we see that in, in uh, all kinds of uh, science related things, whether it's from climate change to vaccines to GMOs to whatever it is. Um, so there's very many different kinds of authority uh, that are at question here. And, uh, and, and so that, that'll be a, a, a helpful uh, distinction to make as we begin to look at, uh, look at that going forward. So it's not True. just about government, although that's certainly uh, clearly an important one. True. I think the um, birth control pill had a lot to do with the decline uh, in the mid sixties. And I know there were people that held the view at that time that we shouldn't have any children, that there just wasn't um, enough resources and uh, we were overpopulated and you know the people were thinking that they shouldn't have any more than two mm -hmm. for sure the maximum and uh, that that's exactly what happened and now we get to the point where we don't have enough people working to support the people <laughs> that are retired <laughs> so that's uh, and so then we have to go to immigration and and that um, maybe like our overall population is declining in Christian uh, religion, and and a lot of um, immigrants were not would not be Christians either. And there we are <laughs> in a pickle. Yeah, yeah the, the question of. Um, when, when, if you remember that pie chart that we looked at, um, you know, certainly showed that this, e even though the dominance of Christianity in our plurally religious world has gone down, it still dwarfs all of the other world religions. So despite the fact that, that everything that we see in the news is talking about Islam and all of these other things, they were still one, two, three percent. Yeah, yeah, it's the nuns. <laughs> it's the nuns. And they're not that Roman the Catholics. <laughs> okay, and, and, and the assumption is, and I haven't seen any numbers that would get any details, but the assumption is that pretty much every one of those nuns is a former Christian <laughs> or, yeah. or, or was a potential Christian. Uh, yeah, and, and so, that heritage. Yeah, exactly. And so the nuns is the section that we really need to pay attention to. Uh, and because maybe that's, that's where the greatest opportunity is too for... Exactly, exactly. For, um, re not retrieval, but just for, you know, if we have something that's appealing to them, then they might be more inclined to listen. Well, the the underlying assumption that we will want to investigate as we go forward is that everyone needs a spiritual home. <laughs> now, whether that's expressed in a church setting or whether that's expressed in some other kind of setting or whether that's expressed in a spiritual but not religious kind of sense, if the if we believe there's an inherent part of humankind that needs to have that part of, as part of their experience, then those nuns, that, that nun sector <laughs> becomes the, the place where you say, clearly what we're doing now is not appealing to them. Mm -hmm. and that's where, where we ask the question is, what does 
a church, a postmodern church, one that lives in an environment where a third of the people would say they have no religious affiliation, what does a church look like in that kind of a place? Mm -hmm. and so that's, that's, I think, the interesting. What, what is this something that appeals to their spiritual depth? Exactly. That they don't even know exists, maybe. <laughs> Perhaps. You know, one of the questions, and again, I'm kind of given, <laughs> given some, uh, uh, some teasers here, is that one of the things that we'll, we'll want to look at is to say, what does the Christian church in an era like we just talked about, where they look at all of the ugliness, all of the scandals, all of the foibles of human humankind, what does the church look like to those people? Does it look to them as it looks to us? Mm. And so uh, those are all some questions that we're going, we want to explore over the next uh, couple of sessions. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, then uh, uh, you're happy. Those that are gathered in places with others, I encourage you to to uh, have your own conversations. And uh, if you have any questions, I should have put on my last screen there, I should have put up an email address uh, where I'd be happy to take emails from, from anybody.